it's about focus. And so I think if you try, if you if you want to solve a really hard problem, if you can wrap yourself, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you in every other thing than you do, right? Yeah. So if you're good at something, you get people who are better than you and everything else. You get a small group of people who are heavily focused on one thing. Shut the door and go and aim for velocity and and high quality systems design. That's basically what we've been doing for nearly a year, <coughs> and it's it's immensely intellectually satisfying we discovered the mind blowing us stuff along the way some of which is horribly scary and some of which is very cool and so it's not been about anything other than how what's the best way to deliver some way cool new technology right and and I, and I, certainly it is the case that a big company can't do what we do because for all the reasons that you know that a big company can't do hard complex leap ahead things in general <clears throat> because big companies get constrained by having to do what their customers tell them to do next. And we get to say, no, forget it. We're going to go back, do something radically different, do something which is of hopefully a profound value. Let's go do mm -hmm. it right. And then we go spend somebody else's money to do it. But yeah. it's a separate problem. Now, when I think of you and your experience, I think specifically virtualization, um, yes. just in the generic terms. Um, is this profound innovation somewhere, somehow related yeah, to that work? Absolutely, yeah. We're, you know, I think <clears throat> that we get old with our GUIs and our skill sets yeah. and our music, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, our DNA is virtualization. Fortunate to have, you know, come up with. So, the, the three founders is myself, Ian, who's yeah. chairman of Zenorg, and then Gaurav Banga, who was CTO and VP of engineering at Phoenix. But he built the first Zen base client hyperledger. They had a thing called Phoenix Hyperspace, which you may remember, which That's allowed you to have ago. a little kind of zero boot time, yeah. instant on, you know, HTML5 flashy kind of gooey Linuxy thing alongside Windows. That never went anywhere, <clears throat> and the technology was sold to HP and lay behind HP's claim to do WebOS on every PC. Again, it never went anywhere, but that's. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so he's also been really. In, at the, the deepest levels of Zen um, and hypervisors, we've managed to get some amazing talent in security, mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, so we're black belt systems and security people. That's kind of what we do. Awesome. And then the only time I ever hear about Bromium in the in the press release cycles, thanks to your uh, fantastic PR people, um, is you're raising money, uh, whatever it is, nine and a half million, give we or take. Now nine point two to start. Nine point two. Uh, continuing to raise money, clearly there's uh, an interest, and I know you just said that you don't have to um, satisfy customers, but these people, people, investors, the big money, are seeing something. So, when you're talking to them, what is the proposition, if not an exit strategy for them and a way to make more money, right? Because it's always for them. It's just it's not they want to change the world and make things easier. It's money. That's right, but it's always value. That, that okay. is, I, I mean, I I don't think technology is of no value in its own right. Right? It has to has to deliver big changes to people in the way that they run their lives. Right? And so, and this is definitely one of those projects. Let, let's put it very simply. Assume Bromium fails miserably, okay? It'll be fun no matter what, because it's gonna go zoom up, and then let's assume it wipes out, it'll go hit the ground with great speed, you know. But what we are doing is fundamental, and it will dramatically change the way that next-gen systems are built, no matter what. Okay. It's a big deal. It's really cool stuff. And so, when you get when you, when you happen to have a really cool idea like that, yeah. you, know, you get to sit and noodle on it for a while, and it's a lot of fun. Good. And then, last question on the generic side of things, because uh, I have a personal interest in open source. Is any of this yeah, related it's to? It's all open source. It's all. So the current the current code base is derived from numerous open source repos. My model of open source, and I think it's just fair to say Ian and Gaurav would agree absolutely, is that if you're going to claim properties related to security, those things have to be open, right? I mean, this, that, I'm not trying to say that open source is inherently secure, it's just a better development methodology for getting too secure. Sure. Right? Okay. And so, <clears throat> open source is a key component of everything we do, but also if you're going to derive value from it other than a following a Red Hat model, combining it with proprietary software is a way to do that. And that's our model. That is, core, core components are open source, you move the world forward, and um, 
and then you combine it with some specific value prop which is unique to your thing that you want to build for your customer and you go and get as much money as you can from that. Sure. Oh. But yeah. open source, I, I have, you know, in, in, in when people talk, talk to me about clouds and so on, you know, I'm absolutely confident that, you know, the open source nature of Zen and DD KVM leads to much better products, much better systems. And, um, and, and I think there are proof points there. You know, I'm not aware of any VM escapes on AWS. Right? It's been going for five years now. Yeah. That thing gets attacked every day by the most crazy schemes you can ever think of. And, you know, I, that just never happened to a proprietary code base. Nobody's done it with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it lends, it, you get more confidence that way. Good. When I think of uh, open source security, there's only one company that comes to mind usually, and that's Sourcefire, uh, you know, Snort, and then there's Sourcefire 3D, kind of, sort of, maybe builds on top of it, proprietary rule set, etc. When you're looking at building a perhaps an open source based security company, do you look to them as a model or is that totally so actually, unrelated? I don't, I don't think we're a security company. Okay. It's going to sound like that because it turns out that at the end of the day, when you look at all of these problems of bringing on desktop or, you know, can I let you log on from Starbucks or any of this stuff, it's all around trust and trustworthiness. We're actually yeah. a trust company. I'll tell you what we're doing. We are, <clears throat> I mean, what we're trying to build is something which is Got okay. strong foundations in computer science. Yeah. Okay. And for that, I'll point you back to the problems uh, from theoretical computer science, like uh, Byzantine fault tolerance and Byzantine generals problem, mm -hmm. which is great stuff to go and read up on. And I will. Um, Late reading. And <clears throat> and build a practical, highly useful, joyful system that is something to delight for you, right? Which is <clears throat> essentially Byzantine fault tolerance. Okay. And so it is a, it's a challenging problem in computer science. Mm -hmm. We're trying to build trustworthy computer infrastructure. Now it sounds like security, but the security industry is all about detecting bad guys and screaming when you do. By the way, they scream mostly when they don't. That is mostly, it's false positives. Yeah. And fairly often there are false negatives and the bad guys get through anyway. So I'm gonna be pretty blunt on that one, the existing security industry is basically in a losing position against malware, which is, you know, morphing enormously. That is, Moore's Law serves the bad guys better than it serves good guys. Right. Really. So, the, the business of detection and all of that stuff is absolutely not what we want to do.